Hello, I am Dr. Rob O'Malley. Thank you for joining us for this session, The Dynamic Past, How Science Helps Give Voice to Silent Stories. This presentation is The Africatown Legacy, Impacts of the Search for and Discovery of the Last Slave Ship by Joycelyn Davis of Africatown Chess. Her presentation will be followed by remarks from Pastor Robert Turner of the historic AME Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. First of all, let me start out by thanking you, Dr. O'Malley and AAAS for allowing me to share my story on your platform. My name is Joycelyn Davis and I'm from Mobile, Alabama, Africa Town. I'm the co-founder of the Clotilda Descendants Association and also a community engagement officer with Africa Town Chess. I'm a direct descendant of Chief Oluwole. Charlie Lewis was his enslaved name. He was one of the survivors of the Clotilda one of the founders of Africa Town, Union Missionary Baptist Church, builder of Mobile County Training School, and founder of Lewis's Quarters, where he bought land from his enslaver, Colonel Thomas Buford, in 1870, where most of my family members live today. Now let's talk about the slave trade. In 1808, it was the slave trade was illegal. The slave trade itself was still going on, but in the United States, the slave trade was illegal. If you were caught in the slave trade business, you will be prosecuted and your punishment will be a hanging. In 1858, there was an article in the Mobile Press Register from the King of Dahomey, present day Benin, that there was a dispute between two tribes and that there was a brisk sale of slaves. In 1859, Timothy Mayer got word of this, along with his brother, other plantation owners, business businessmen were at the Riverboat having a good time. Mind you, Timothy Mary was the richest landowner in Mobile County. So he made a bet that he could bring slaves under the U.S. Marshal Notes without being caught. So Timothy Mayer hires Captain William Foster, the best sea captain of the Gulf Coast of Mississippi. Together, they crafted the Clotilda. The Clotilda was a schooner. It looked like a treasure boat, a pleasure boat, smooth and sleek. It had a hole in it where it could hold 100 plus people. Now, Foster did not go alone. He hired a crew to help him set sail to the homie, present day Benin. And also on this journey, he took with him $9,000 in gold to exchange to King Lily. And also, the, they had to make sure that these captives were able to eat. They, they had water on the ship. They had bread. And they also had vinegar. So they wouldn't be uh, vitamin, vitamin C deficiency. The, the vinegar would help them with that. So then arrival in Benin, Fawcett and his crew met with King Lili to make their trade. Before leaving the shore, those captives had to walk through the door of no return and walk around the tree of forgiveness. They had to forget who they were, their family, their religion, and everything that they knew from their homeland. Timothy Mayor got a tip from the U.S. Marshals that, that Timothy Mayor got a tip from the U.S. government that the U.S. Marshals was on his, on his tail by the Mississippi River. So he sent word to Captain Foster to disembark to disembark those captains off into a riverboat into the dark of the night. Because the authorities were looking for a ship and not a boat, Captain Foster destroyed the evidence by burning and, sh and sinking the ship. In 1860, those brave captives landed on American soil, forming a community, church, and school. Now let's fast forward to 2018, 2019. The Clotilda was discovered by Ben Rains and also an archaeological arch, archaeology firm company, Search Inc. It was called by the Alabama Historical Commission to help investigate, to make sure that this was indeed the Clotilda by the nails, the wood, and Captain Foster's log. The Africatown community was once a self-sustainable community with fruit trees, barbershops, a hotel, post office, dry cleaners, laundromat, and grocery store. We did not have to leave the community for anything. Africa Town have seen some struggles. Over the years with businesses shutting down and heavy industry in the place of those businesses surrounding the area and leaving illnesses 
and leaving certain illnesses that affected the community. Africa Town Chest mission is to stop heavy industry that will bring in any harmful toxins that would affect the community. My role as a community engagement officer is to conduct health surveys, inform the community on community meetings, what industries are currently trying to impose on the neighborhood. We also connect with other environmental groups through the deep south of environmental justice. We convene with others, with other underserved communities from Pensacola, Houston, and New Orleans. This past spring and summer, the deep south of environmental justice helped, helped conduct a COVID-19 training for the Africatown com and surrounding communities. My hope with all the attention of the finding of the Clotilda is that the community grow by revitalization, economic growth, strengthening our schools and making Africatown the truest attraction. Thank you so much for your time and allowing me to share the information on the Africatown Clotilda story. And I would like to leave with one fun fact. Quest Love, the drummer for the Jimmy Fallon show and leader of the group, the Root Roots, found his, traced his roots back to Africa Town. Thank you. And again, thank you so much, Dr. O'Malley, Triple AS. Please check out our two websites, www.africatownchest.org and www.theclotildastory.com. And again, thank you. Thank you, Joycelyn. Um, now, uh, Pastor Turner of AME Church of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, will join the conversation. Welcome, Pastor Turner. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, by the way, I love your name. I think second to Jesus is the best name in the world, uh, Robert. Um, I'm so privileged to have been from Alabama, born and raised. Uh, in fact, my youngest son was born in Mobile, Alabama. Um, I served as a pastor there for several years. And just hearing the story about uh, the Clotilda and Africa Town, um, I know very, very well. I knew a lot of people from Africa Town. Such an honor to meet Jocelyn and um, what she and her family have endured. Um, I think it's, it's traumatic, um, but I'm thankful that she's able to be alive today and tell the story. Um, and, and, and to continue to elevate this discussion uh, about how the U.S. government uh, participated in ki kidnapping and, ab and, and abducting human beings, right? And even after it was the slave trade was outlawed, how you still had citizens who wanted to prove a point and how African-Americans were, and Africans were seen as just chattel that we could be using a wager or a bet uh, is sickening. Um, but her family's story um, and her family's existence and survival, I think is, is really uh, something that we need to elevate more. Put, to put a face on this terrible, largest mass transportation of Americans, of human beings in the history of the world. Slave trade was the largest mass transportation, mass Mass, trans mass transportation of any group of people in the history of the world. Um, and, and her family is a legacy of that. My family is a legacy of that. But her family is, is from the last shipment of those individuals who made that terrible voyage. Um, and I'm thankful that instead of running away from that history, she's seeking to elevate that. I, just, I can't wait until those divers bring up those artifacts and I just can't imagine what they would what they're going to find um the story is so broad um when I think about the story I think about all individuals involved because Captain Foster did not go over to Benin empty-handed he went over with nine thousand dollars in gold so there was an exchange and also that, you know, those Africans had to go through the door of no return. They had to walk around a tree of forgetfulness. They had to forget who they were, forget their home, forget everything. So for me within this story, 
I want to visit Benin, find out who my ancestors were, find out where Chief Alule lived. And I've done the, the African ancestry. So when I get my results, they're going to pinpoint me to, the, to my ancestors. And with the discovery, my mind is just going, I want to know about Captain Foster, the crew that were on the ship. You know, because when I was growing up, the story was that these guys made a bed and they went to Africa. As I became an adult, I, you know, I, I, I read Dr. Natalie's book. I read Sylvia's book and I read Emma Langdon Roach's book and I also read Barracoon. So there was a lot of things that I did not know about the story. I didn't know that Captain Foster had to have permission to even come in, to even come ashore. He had to get permission. So, and then also the, how the story goes, it was Timothy Mayer and his business partners. So Chief Alule was enslaved by Colonel Thomas Buford. So I want to find that family. Um, Chief Alule, with Charlie Lewis, his enslaved name, founded a little small section in Africa town called Lewis's Quarters that was established in 1870, which some of my family members still live there today. And Captain, I mean, Colonel Thomas Buford's wife, Grave, is in Lewis's Quarters. So I'm digging more into this story as years and as time goes by. Um, it's so many layers to the story because again, it was Timothy Mayer and his business partners and there were 110. So therefore, Captain Foster received 10. I understand that Timothy Mayer received the bulk of them, but I wanna know how who the other businessmen that were able to get those enslaved Africans. And then also we, the descendants have connected with Matilda who was shipped to uh, Selma, which for years we thought that Cudjo Lewis was the oldest living survivor, but we found out mm -hmm. that Matilda Creer, she lived into 1940, Cudjo Lewis lived to 1935. So we connected with that family. And that's our goal is to connect with others because there were 32 families that resided in Africa town and some were shipped to St. Louis, some were shipped to Selma. So it wasn't just a drunken bit. You know, there was a crew. There was King Glee. Um, the sh how the ship was built, it was built, you know, it was 55 men and 55 women. They all came from different tribes. They did not speak the same language. That this was so well thought out that you had, to me, in my opinion, there were two masterminds. There was Timothy Mayer and King Lily. I cannot, and although it hurts, I cannot dismiss the fact the involvement of those in Benin. And that's where the reconciliation comes in that we can sit across from one another and talk about the slave trade. I think, and as you see behind me, reparations now, a lot of folks want to know what that includes. Uh, it includes a lot of things. And one of them should be, you know, us finding out where we came from. And that should not be something that we have to pay for. So I'm, I'm thankful to be able to be a part of this discussion with scientists all over the world, um, particularly in America. So as we wrestle with this whole notion of genealogy and, and the search for people and the search for identity and the search of origin, that we don't forget African-Americans are the slither of people in our population. We are the only people in this country that did not choose to come here. The only people in this country that did not choose to come here are African-Americans. But yet we are, if we want to know where we came from, we have to pay money. So it's like we're getting taxed on top of our oppression. You know, I call it the black tax. We, you know, created in our own enterprise if of economics. Before affirmative action, before Pell Grants, before um, any governmental urban initiative program, black people, not even two generations out of slavery, developed their own economic ecosystem where the dollar 
stayed in our community and we thrived. And white people hated it out of racism. White people were jealous because we were two generations out of slavery. You still had Confederate generals still living. And it disgusted them that when in a time in this country where we couldn't legally vote, we couldn't legally know how to read, we couldn't legally write, but yet and still you had black doctors, black dentists, black lawyers, and we kept our own money. So what did the government do? What did the people do? When they were those same people who were raised by slave owners, same folk who were raised by Confederate soldiers, who were raised, taught that black people could not read, black people could not write, black people were dumb, black people only could survive being dependent upon white people. And when they went and saw black Africa towns or little Africans all over the country, that that messed with their psyche. Like, hold up, I was raised taught that these black folks were monkeys. These black folks don't have souls. These black people, you know, were three fifths of human beings. How in the world they have bigger houses than we? How in the world they got in in 1920s? People in Tulsa had automobiles. They had just been invented in the 1920s. African Americans in Tulsa, we had six families in a town of 10,000 people in a community of 10,000 people. We had six families who owned their own airplanes. On their own airplanes. We had just learned how to fly. That just shows you how prosperous black people were. And that drove white folks crazy. Drove them nuts. So what do you do oftentimes when your lie meets the truth? Most sensible people, when your lie meets the truth, you accept the truth. But racists, when their lie meets the truth, they seek to destroy the truth and continue believing and passing down their lie. So 1921, even before 1921 for Tulsa, in the summer of 1919, they called the Red Summer, all over the country, black economic enterprise zones, economic mega places, black Wall Streets all over the country were under attack and destroyed. You had over 52 black race massacres in the year 1919. 52, almost one for each state in the union. They were destroyed. And in 1921, the largest one of those occurred right here in Tulsa, where over 600 businesses, we know of at least 300 people killed. All this happened. 600 businesses destroyed, 1,256 homes destroyed. Over 10,000 people were made homeless in less than 18 hours. In less than 18 hours, that happened. First time airplanes used to drop bombs on American soil. Not doing night, I mean, not doing 9-11, not doing Pearl Harbor, but right here in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that happened sanctioned by the government. The folk who did it weren't just some white vigilantes. These people were deputized by the sheriff department. And this was after statehood. So this happened in America. This happened not in the territory of Oklahoma. And to this day, now one of those folk who flew those planes, who dropped those bombs, who used those machine guns, ever were charged with a crime. And now I'm pastor here in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the historic Vernon Amy Church, um, where our basement, where we are the site of, of the worst race massacre in American history. And so I want to share that on top of what Jocelyn eloquently mentioned um, about what happened here. And I'll be welcome to have any questions. Thank you very much, Joycelyn and Robert. We hope you will join us for a live discussion with all presenters in this session at the virtual AAAS annual meeting on February 10th at 3 p.m. Eastern time.